Our first lesson this morning, Old Testament reading, comes from the prophet Isaiah, chapter 61, beginning at verse 10 through 11. I will greatly rejoice. My soul shall be joyful in my God. For he has clothed me with the garments of salvation. He has covered me with the robe of righteousness. As a bridegroom decks himself with ornaments, and as a bride adorns herself with jewels. For as the earth brings forth its bud, as the garden causes the things that are sown in it to spring forth, so the Lord God will cause righteousness and praise to spring forth before all the nations. Our second reading this morning, our epistle lesson, is from 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 3 through 9. A heavenly inheritance. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his abundant mercy has begotten us again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled, and that does not fade away, reserved in heaven for you, who are kept by the power of God through faith for salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. In this you rejoice, though now for a little while, if need be, you have been grieved by various trials, that the genuineness of your faith being much more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to praise and honor and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ, whom having seen not you love, though now you do not see him, yet believing, you rejoice with joy inexpressible and full of glory, receiving the end of your faith, the salvation of your soul. And our gospel lesson this morning is from John chapter 14, verses 1 through verse 12. The way, the truth, and the life. Let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. And if it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am you may be also. And where I go you know, and the way you know. Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you are going. How can we know the way? Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you had known me, you would have known my Father also. And from now on you know him and have seen him. And Philip said to him, Lord, show us the Father, and it is sufficient for us. Jesus said to him, Have I been with you so long, and yet you have not known me, Philip? He who has seen me has seen the Father. So how can you say, show us the Father? Do you not believe that I am in the Father and the Father in me? The words that I speak to you, I do not speak on my own authority, but the Father who dwells in me does these works. Believe me that I am in the Father, and the Father is in me, or else believe me for the sake of the works themselves. Most assuredly, I say to you, he who believes in me, the works that I do, he will do also, and greater works than these he will do, because I go to my Father. Here ends the reading. Let us pray before the preaching of God's word today. Lord God, Heavenly Father, we pray that uh, as we hear this word today, that you would bless us, that you would open our minds and our hearts. Lord God, may they be stirred today to reach out to you and receive the many blessings that you have for us. Lord, may your law speak to our hearts and show us our sins like a mirror. But Lord, may your gospel even more so illumine us with joy and with excitement and relief to know that our sins are forgiven for Jesus Christ's sake. So teach us, Lord, to repent of our sins and to trust in you for life and in death. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, our title to today's sermon is called GPS to J-E-S-U-S. 
And one of the most helpful technological innovations to come to use in recent decades is global positioning system, or as we call it by its abbreviation. When you turn the wrong direction, GPS will make sure it will make some type of sound, a little ding to let you know that you've gone the wrong way and that you need to be directed back to the correct path. And it will recalculate, and sometimes it gets kind of annoying when you know that you're going a different way than what they're telling you to do. It'll keep saying recalculating, recalculating, but it's trying to help. Now, I remember that a number of years ago when people talked about their GPS, that they referred to it as a TomTom, or I remember people calling it a Garmin, too, and it's not a subject that I know that much about, but it's the technology has evolved. But what has not changed in our navigation as human beings is how sometimes you and I do not interpret those directions correctly. You likely have heard a story of people who have actually driven into lakes or have driven off of cliffs because GPS said that's what you should do. Now the TomTom -tom or Garmin or whatever usually shows the best way, but there are sometimes mistakes, and I imagine some of you who use it uh, have found times where it brings you to the wrong place. I think of myself where it's taken me to a former location of where something was, and then they moved to a different place. Then I was late, and I should have known better. I'd left more time. So we got the TomTom, -tom, how it can bring us to the wrong place if we don't do our homework first. You think of Thomas at the time of Jesus. We heard him question our Lord this morning. When he says, Lord, we do not know the way where you are going, even though Jesus said, you know the way where I am going. But Jesus did not leave Thomas, nor did he leave Philip in the lurch, that he showed them the way to eternal life. He did not desire that his disciples would despair about how to get to heaven. Now, one thing that very much distinguishes Christianity in its proclamation of the way to eternity is that other religions... The ultimate reality is something that you have to figure out for yourself. How do you get to that other? How do you climb your way to heaven or nirvana or whatever term, paradise, whatever you want to use? But not so with the Christian faith. It is not a path of search. Jesus has laid the way out for us clearly. No, we cannot see a yellow brick road like the Wizard of Oz. But Jesus has gone the way for us and has returned to show us how to be with him in eternal life. It's not about meditating. It's not about following a set pattern of rules to earn your way up the ladder, climbing each step higher up. Christ Jesus has walked that way. He walked it on this earth as he walked the Via Dolorosa, as it's called in Latin, the way of most pain. That he went that way so that you and I need not struggle in trying to find our way to eternity. So the way is not hidden, especially in this part of the world. Now, we are fortunate in our day and age, even though we see the church decline in many places, attendance uh, decreasing, but Still in our country, almost every city that you would visit in our nation, you see a church. There is a reminder that there is one way to heaven, and that is through Jesus Christ. As he said, as we heard in the scripture reading today, I am the way, the truth, and the life. The story of the way to life eternal is something that we celebrate each time we gather together. And we celebrate the resurrection, we celebrate the Easter season, and it's not news to you in the sense that it's something you've never heard before. I assume each person sitting here today knows the news of the gospel, of Jesus' resurrection from the dead. And yet we call it good news because you need to be reminded of it over and over again. The world brings you so many problems. The world brings so many things to your doorstep that you need to be reminded that, yes, in spite of all your troubles and all your worries and all the sins that continue to tempt you, and all the times when you feel lonely, that Jesus Christ is walking with you in this life and has already laid out the way for you to eternal life. You don't have to have special knowledge. You don't need to be a very important person with a privileged access to make your way to heaven. Now, there were some in the early church who thought this, that they mixed Greek philosophy together with the Christian faith. 
And they use the word gnosis, G-N-O-S-I-S. It's the same word, uh, same origin that we have the word prognosticate, to know ahead of time, knowledge. They believe that Jesus Christ came to give us knowledge, and if we just had knowledge, then we could find our way to all truth. But it's much more than knowledge. It's much more than just knowing something in your head. It's walking the way unto eternal life, not earning the way. There's a big difference. It's not making each mark and thinking, I've made it another step. But it's simply following Jesus, going where he has already gone into eternity. As we in the church continue to see problems with uh, a lack of faith as secularity becomes more prominent in our society, that we find in many churches today that there is not much focus, or there certainly is less focus on the end things, the things of eternity, of judgment, of eternal life. Yes, you may hear of heaven, but it's only some type of happy place where you know people just kind of get together for a nice reunion with family and friends. How little do we really concentrate on the importance of the end of days? I remember hearing a pastor one time in a church I was visiting at in the Twin Cities, and this pastor, during the sermon, this pastor said, it doesn't matter where you're going. It just matters that you're on the journey. And I thought, if I'm going unto eternity, I want to know where I'm headed. That is not the way you want to enter into eternal life or into eternity by just going along for the ride. No, Jesus has laid out the way for us. There is a destination. It's like being in a car where you don't know where you're going. How much more at peace and how calm you are when you know the path, when you know where you're going. The most of the time when you're going somewhere, when you travel, it's, it's reassuring to see a few familiar landmarks, even if the GPS is guiding you, because you know that once in a while machines can make mistakes. How nice it is when you are somewhere far away and you see somebody you know. I'll never forget that. When my, I was telling my mother uh, about my, I was going to study in Mexico for two months, in 2001, this was even before uh, September 11, 2001, so it was a lot easier to travel there in those days. And my mom wanted to just know every detail about, the, you know, who are you going to be staying with and what kind of meals are they going to serve you and when are you going to go to school and how far is it from your host home to your school and everything. We understand that. She wanted to know. She was nervous. Would I be safe being in a different country that she had never visited before? And then as I was telling her, I said, Mom, I appreciate your concern. I am a little bit nervous myself, and I certainly was. I remember when I uh, walked off the plane that I carried my luggage everywhere with me. I even brought it right into the bathroom and put it right next to me so that nobody could grab it because I had my passport and all those things in there, my clothes. I'd be two months without anything. So I understand the fear of going to a place where you don't know where you're headed exactly. But then I told my mother, remember, for one week, the first week I'm going to be down there, one of my classmates from the university is also going to be there. And for some reason, that just gave her such peace. Even though she'd never met this other student, she didn't know anything about this student, but that there would be somebody there who would know if something was wrong with me. And so we can understand that. We can understand why many people, and even yourselves, why you're afraid to die. Yes, it's a scary thing when you haven't been there yet. But we need not be afraid because Jesus is already there waiting for us. It's like me telling my mom, there's going to be a good friend there waiting for me. And Jesus is there waiting for you. And all those who have gone before you in faith will be waiting for you at the resurrection on the last day. And in some ways, it's easier for us to find comfort in the resurrection because we hear this story so frequently. We know these stories. This is the Easter story, after all. And the, the, If you don't know any, uh, hardly any other story in the Bible, you at least know this one. But there is still much for which to wonder about. And you, you hear people in their fear many times talking about death and what comes and when, what will be like when the end arrives at this earth. And especially, there's this fascination, I'm sure you'll, you've noticed this, and I've talked about this before, and you'll relate to this, is that there is such fascination, not so much with death and what heaven is like, as much as there's a strange obsession 
with what's it going to be like when Jesus comes at the second coming? And people who have no interest in where they go to when they die or what's going to happen to them in eternity, but they're so tuned into that thought of, you know, what's it, what day is it going to be and when's it, what's it going to be like and what are the signs and that kind of thing. I think I noticed this at its clearest point. Do you remember about 10 years ago, there was this fellow on TV or in the radio. His name was Harold Camping. And Harold Camping said that the end of time is going to come on May 21st, 2011, and I think it was 6 p.m. I can't remember for sure the time, but there was an exact moment that he said the world's going to end. And then, of course, people asked him all these questions. You know, is it going to end at the international date line and then go all the way around the earth 24 hours, or is it going to be all at once, and we're all going to see it just like that? And I don't remember what the answer was. But anyway, uh, and it was so strange that the media just picked up on this because people have been saying this since Christ ascended back into heaven. People have always been trying to calculate it. The year 1000 A.D., there were people who were saying this was going to be the end at the, at the millennium, and, and, and they prepared themselves, and they sold all their things, and they sat outside, looked up at the sky, and waited for Jesus to come back. But it did not come true then at 1000 A.D., nor did it come true for Harold Camping. I remember the, the moment, though, it was kind of, you know, something that you remember. I remember sitting there at about five minutes to and looking at my watch and four minutes to and wondering if this was going to come or not. And it didn't come. And then I think I went on social media and watched or read everybody's comments about their disappointment or well, I don't know, whatever. But people had a lot to say about it, put it that way. But the media became so fixated on this, and I couldn't figure out why. But then I remembered that this is not a new phenomenon to our country, that there have been many, and even in this nation, in our short history of 200-some years. And probably the most famous example in our history is uh, when there was a fellow, his name was William Miller. And uh, William Miller, through his calculations, predicted that the time would come somewhere between March 21st, 1843, and March 21st, 1844. So somewhere in that year. And this really caught the attention of, of people. And same kind of phenomenon. People sold their things. They quit their jobs. And everybody was waiting. And the press just, you know, loved the sensationalism of this. And, well, it didn't happen. The day came and went. And then Miller got back to his studies and he said, I, I guess I missed something. I don't know. I forgot to carry the two or what it was. But uh, somehow uh, his calculations were wrong. And then he said, okay, no, this is when it's going to be. It's going to be this day. And there was even more hype the second time. And people really got into it. And then it didn't happen. So October 23rd, 1844, the second time did not come. And so that date in history is known in our country as the day of the great disappointment. Now the Jehovah's Witnesses also have made predictions specific declarations that the world is going to end at this specific date. It hasn't happened. Now I imagine that most of you have not been caught into that kind of hype because you know from the scriptures what the Bible says. Jesus says that you know even only the Father in heaven knows the day or the hour when his Son will return. It's not that we are without signs either that this day is soon approaching. We see how our society and our culture continues to deteriorate, how the family falls apart, and how doubt and fear are ever more present in the minds of the people. While there are wonderings, while you may think, is this going to be the time now coming up pretty soon, or is it going to be years down the road, or is it going to be many years down the road? Yet we do not know. Those things are hidden from us. But the one thing that we do know the thing that is settled, the thing that has already taken place for us is that Jesus will be the one to come. He not only points out the way, he is the way. And that's what's so great about our Lord, that when he speaks about these things, they're not abstractions. You know, just like it's not a method to follow, it's not a formula to figure out. When Jesus Christ says he is the way, he means that he himself has gone the way for us. That he's not just simply guessing and doing calculations and he's giving us the best guess of how to get there. No, he's already gone there and he's come back. 
think of it like being on an airplane. When you go on an airplane, you do not know the exact hour that the airplane will leave land. You know generally about what time, but it's never guaranteed, and it never leaves exactly on the hour that they plan. Something goes wrong. Somebody makes trouble on the plane. There are weather conditions that prevent them from leaving right away. Whole list of possibilities of why your plane will not leave at the hour that it is scheduled. But you do know that the plane will take you there. And even if for some reason the plane does not take you there that day, they're going to reschedule you to take another flight to get to your destination. And that's how we can think of it with Christ and him coming to this world and showing us the way and then we're like being on an airplane, that we're going to get there. It's going to be tough. It's going to be uh, some, you know, you have to think like your airplane might crash, just like you experienced many troubles in life that you were not anticipating. But Jesus will bring you there. He is the one who will take you. It's not so much a question of when. It's a question more of who. Who is going to bring you to eternal life? As uh, the disciples asked Jesus, show us the Father, and then we'll know. And Jesus says, I am the way to eternal life. Simply follow me. Believe what I tell you. The Father is in me, and I am in the Father. So leave it to God's Son to deliver you to where he is. As Jesus said, where I go, I prepare a place for you that you may be where I am. And that, oh, those are strange words, are they not? Because Jesus was telling them in time and in space. He said that where I am, you may be also. He wasn't speaking this from heaven with a booming voice saying, where I am, you may be also. He was saying that in conversation, where I am, you may be also. Because see, Jesus, he bound himself to time by being uh, born as a baby, but he exists outside time as well, that he is beyond those limitations. So when he says, where I am, you may be also, that he is eternity now, that he has come now. And so you have eternal life right now through Jesus Christ, so that when you get to the other side, when the resurrection happens in all its glory, that it will simply just be a change of scenery, really, for you, that you have fellowship with God now if you trust in him to be your Savior, and that you will simply be enjoying his presence in a, in a more profound way. So you don't need to feel that you're lost and you're just blindly trying to make your way to eternal life and hope that you get there if you make it the right way or follow the right path. That Jesus Christ, he himself is eternal life. He's not just a destination. He is with you right now. He is present with you right where you are. So Jesus has purchased your ticket. I don't need to navigate the way, and neither do you. You don't need to figure out when the hour will be. That is already determined by the Father. For those of you who already know who will transport you to heaven, it is a comfort then. It is a comfort that Jesus Christ will not abandon you to the grave. For who really wants to know the last day anyway? If you knew your last day upon earth, would you enjoy any more days? No, you'd just be looking at the calendar and marking down, okay, I got three months, okay, now it's two months, three weeks, you get the idea. Just, you would just be marking it down. And so our Lord has hidden these things from us so that we can be of service to others, that we can be at peace in our hearts and that we can bless others with the time that we have. He simply promised that he will take you to be with him where he already is, that he's in that eternal state, glorified. And so be thankful this morning that J-E-S-U-S, is your J GPS for today and tomorrow, for all of your life and for eternity. Let us pray. Lord God, we come to you today. We hear this sermon this morning, Lord, and we thank you that we live in a day and an age that uh, where we can have many tools and technologies that take us where we need to be. Lord, we thank you that we have something, though, much greater than any uh, electronic navigation to eternal life, that you have come entered history, entered time and space to tell us that you will bring us to eternal life, that just as we have eternal life and we believe in you right now, Lord God. And so we thank you, Lord, that we need not try to stumble our way through life, trying to see if we can discover it in some obscure place, hiding, that we could somehow stumble upon the truth, Lord, if we were so fortunate. But know that you've revealed all that we need to know. 
Lord, to us. And so we give you thanks that you have laid out the way for us. Lord, not with uh, bricks and stones and pavement, but that you sent your son Jesus Christ to teach us how to, to live and how to die. And Lord, whenever that day is when uh, you will come again to this earth and take us to be with you or whether we die and the resurrection comes, Lord God, not important as your son reminded uh, his disciples. Lord, we thank you that we need not fear where we are going, that it's not a question of where or when, but it's who. That you sent your son, Jesus Christ, who has gone into eternity, risen from the dead, and now will bring us to eternal life. Realizing that first in our lives as we deepen in our faith and bringing it to completion, as our sins are buried in Christ Jesus, so we shall be like him, seeing you face to face. So Lord, may each one of us uh, repent of our sins. May we grieve the times in our lives where we have sought to forge our own path. But Lord, that we would simply follow where you have laid the way out for us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.